Sabayoth doesn't seem to have like explored the technology very well because mm. he's very confused about like oh what, what what's a spotty tube yeah because he's very like oh you know er- i can do everything through the force you know he's very like religious very spiritual mm. and very personal as well yeah he wants that one-on-one connection with his dominions we don't need an energy source i am the energy source <laughs> he powers the whole village on his peloton bike <laughs> <laughs> all right hello there you've found the lost holocron an ancient artifact of lore and legends from a galaxy far far away each transmission of the Lost Holocron, you will join an episodic discussion of media from the Star Wars universe. We will be your guides. Tim. Hey. Kyle. Hi there. Scott. Hey. And I'm Stuart. We will be covering the material up to and including Chapter 8 of Heirs of the Empire. So, Tim, what's the story so far? All right. So far, the New Republic and Imperial Remnants are struggling for control of the galaxy, each holding comparable military might and galactic territory. Looking to reverse the tide, the last of the Imperial Grand Admirals has found and bargained for the favor of a cloned Dark Jedi, offering up both the adult and unborn Skywalker twins. A trap for the Skywalkers was laid and sprung during a diplomatic mission for the Republic to Bimisari. However, the unidentified alien commandos were unprepared to face Jedi Knight Luke Skywalker. Luke, Leia, and Han escape unscathed, but the nature of their assailants are still a mystery to them. Yeah. Kyle, what happened in this chapter? Oh, fantastic. So, so far, Captain Pelion reports to Grand Admiral Thrawn detailing the failure of the Nagori to capture the Skywalkers and the recovery of the tech found on Wayland. Dark Jedi Master Sabayoth expresses impatience and a plan is hatched to capture the Skywalkers, one that suits Thrawn's upcoming plans that necessitates Sabayoth's presence for a raid on the Sluice Van shipyard. Meanwhile, back in Coruscant, the New Republic are unable to identify the assailants at Bimisari, and as a result, politics stall. While Leia Organa Solo is set to return to Bimisari to resume negotiations, she requests more space in her schedule to advance her Jedi studies, but finds no support within the Council, citing her expertise as indispensable. I thought it was pretty cool to jump between factions in this chapter. I noticed that too. That was something I was like, is this the first for this so far? It is, yeah, because the first six chapters went like Imperial Republic, Imperial Republic, etc. And then we had two chapters of Republic action with our heroes. And now we have a split. Mm -hmm. And it was cool. I'm not always a fan of the split chapters, but I feel like the the theme was quite fairly contained in this this section. Yeah, because they're both related, you know, like, Thrawn and Pelion are talking about how their plan failed and mm. how did Luke basically, you know, stop them. But then on the other side, on the Republic side, they're like, who are these people trying to get us? Yeah, their plan failed too. Yeah, they're, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. We're seeing the same scenario from both sides in this chapter. <laughs> really cool. It's like a shadow war. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and we find out what the third item they were looking for on uh, Mount Tantus was. On Leyland. Right. Yeah. So how how would you pronounce this? Is this a Sparty tube? Yeah, I would say Sparty. Yeah, yeah, Sparty tubes. I'm pretty sure that's how the audiobook said it, Sparty tubes. It kind of like gives that feeling of like Spartan as well. So I wonder if it's like super soldier sort of tech or because there's a the, the line says that it is a, a f- fine equipment for us to rebuild the empire. So I'm thinking it's either like super soldier technology or mm. like something like the Star Forge, maybe that um, mm. creates some sort of like robotic tech or like probably not as magical as the Star Forge, just creating. <laughs> yeah. <that. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or th- as maybe it's some sort of um, energy cylinder as well. Mm. Because they talk about, like, the, because we don't know how big these tubes are, they could be just, like, power cells or, um, or, or something to just give them some sort of technological edge. Yeah, no. I, I definitely get the same impression as you, where it's definitely not like this magical space station that creates all the ships and robots you want, you know, like the Star Forge. It's, <laughs> yeah. I, I imagine it's... I get the impression it's something a bit more fundamental. So like an energy source makes sense to me. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think that's 
also why it would be called a tube. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. First thing that came to my mind was like the tube that, like the back to tube that Luke was in, you know, after oh, he was recovering okay. from Hoth. But oh, yeah. I mean, it seemed this, I, I don't know, that might be too, you know, thinking too small on this scale because it doesn't seem like that would be something that could help rebuild the Empire. I mean, I'm sure they have a million of those already. I mean, uh, maybe if it's like a super soldier serum. Yeah, yeah, something like that. You know, make like Captain America's out of all their soldiers or something. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and Captain Empire. But the other thing is that Sabayoth doesn't seem to have like explored the technology very well because mm. he's very confused about like, oh, what, what what's a Sparty tube? Yeah, he hasn't used any of the planetary defenses. So, is he a technophobe or? Like, I think I think in a way, yeah, because he seems like he's kind of almost intentionally keeping himself ignorant to what these are or has in the past. Oh, okay. You know, I do think that, you know, technophobe, I think that's a good word for him because he's very mm. like, oh, you know, er I can do everything through the force. You know, he's very like religious, very spiritual. Mm. And very personal as well. I wouldn't say it's a yeah. phobia. I'd say it's more of a lack of interest. Ma yeah. Ap apathy. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. He wants that one-on-one -on -one connection with his dominions, with his emissaries. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we know we don't need an energy source. I am the energy source. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> he powers the whole village on his Peloton bike. <laughs> <laughs> I did like Sabiath's argument for going after Luke because he was like, "Well, he's a Jedi Knight, and I'm a Jedi Master, so he will answer my call. He will come to me, basically." But mm. Ron is very much like, "No, I need you here to help bolster the troops." But well, you know, if you want him to help you, you need to give him what he wants, which is Luke or Leia and, and the twins in this case. And, yeah. and you know, it's like, if you give him what he wants first, then he'll help you bolster the troops. Yeah. I don't think Thrawn cares. <laughs> yeah, I guess no. not. I don't get the impression that he has much respect for anything related to the force. Well, no, he does true. seem to look down his nose at that. I mean, I feel like he looks down his nose at everything. I, I, I don't think there's much that he respects. <laughs> Except for Pelion when he brings up a useful idea. Well, yeah. yeah. I thought that was yeah. cool. He's like, you don't have to apologize. You know, you don't care if yeah. you cut in. He seems yeah. very utilitarian in mm -hmm. most aspects of his character. Yeah. But kind of going back on Thrawn's idea of the Force, it, it's very much like, it's like, oh, I have my Isomari. You know, it's like the Force is useless. And, and you know, basically I can negate the Force and I can, mm. it's like something else that he can conquer. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. Yeah. What I think is an interesting contrast is that Sabaoth is very in the moment and he doesn't really care about these lofty plans that take years or decades to come to fruition. Whereas that is all that Throne seems to care about. Yeah. Like he says that, oh, you know, if you know Gri is not going to deplete our stores mm -hmm. of, or, or our, um, I can't remember the words that he used. Right. Yeah. He was so cold about them. Yeah. Yeah. But he was just like, eh, a couple of lives here or there don't matter. We've got long arching plans that, uh, you know, there's there's definitely a few pivotal pieces that he wants to pay, like, particular personal attention to. But, um, you know, there's those two characters. One of them wants what's in the moment. And I feel like a little bit, if Sabaoth gets Luke or his Jedi, that he's going to become a lot less cooperative to the uh, Imperial interests. True. Yeah. He definitely has to be thinking about that. Uh, I did like that in this chapter, it's mentioned that the Yasalamari yes, are just kind of around on the ship. Mm -hmm. And I love the yeah. idea that they got too many and that they just got like a weird <laughs> infestation and they're just kind of hanging everywhere, <laughs> wandering around, <laughs> just doing whatever they want. <laughs> they're yeah, like walking by great. and they step into some Mari poop. Because I thought he had one, but it seems like they have a bunch and i have no yeah. idea how many they have mm. so we mentioned before about how thrawn still calls this the rebellion but mm. one thing i noticed how um pelion was like the new republic i mean the rebellion when he was talking to thrawn right oh, yeah. yeah it's almost like pelion actually respects them in a way as as the new republic mm. i mean outside of of thrawn's command center it seems to be referred to as the new republic as well yeah um, the petty officer at the beginning, he referred to it as the New Republic. And mm. yeah, that I wonder how aggressive 
Thrawn might have been in the past about nomenclature. Yeah. And uh, I, I spent a lot of time in this chapter wondering what the fall of Thrawn is going to look like. I I, I mm. see it as either he's going to unravel at one point or mm. if he's going to just make a mistake. I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. I'm, I'm very interested to see where that's going to go. I think it'll be his own hubris in some I think so too. way, shape, or form. My hubris? <laughs> <laughs> But you make a good point. Like, I think it's either going to go the way of Tarkin all the way up to the last moment, feeling like he's mm. been vindicated and then just being blown up on the Death Star, <laughs> which is not a bad way to go. That seems pretty instantaneous. Yeah. Or, as you said, he just becomes unraveled. I don't know. That's, that's a hard picture to see what that's like. Just go for Zua from Avatar The Last Airbender. <laughs> <laughs> just mad with power. Maybe he'll be like the cornered rat, you know, just like fighting the last breath. Or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I can foresee. I can foresee him and Palpatine kind of having a similar downfall with their hubris in a way. Uh, being stabbed in the back. Not necessarily that, but just like, uh, like, you know, becoming so full of themselves and just becoming so arrogant that they don't see their own downfall basically coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, underestimating how. Um, those working with them feel yeah in general um also like snoke with kylo right yeah. right what did you think of um Sabaoth in this chapter because i felt like we got to see him a little bit like not 100 percent present he seems to like be a sort of like frayed tapestry almost he probably is a bit overwhelmed or out of his element mm, okay yeah he's probably overwhelmed by all the technology and by the all all the salamiri everywhere. Oh, oh yeah, he, he's basically blinded. Yeah, mm, that could be quite disorienting. Because I was wondering if it's the um, as mentioned earlier that clones tend to degrade with age, and whether he's um. just kind of he's acting all regal in some points and very um, stern or volatile in other points, and very kind of like wounded particularly in the beginning of like, well, why aren't you giving me my Jedi? Am I just something to be cast aside? And then, <laughs> and then him regally stroking his beard at the end of the chapter. Hmm, <laughs> yes, this suits me. I'll be in my chambers. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I, I just, me too. It's <laughs> time for his workout. <laughs> Stroked his abs. I mean, beard. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. They mention clones degrading as they age as if humans don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely in a. I, I would say overall, not in his element. Um, mm. Also, I mean, right, he does appear to be a bit more erratic compared to when we first saw him. Yeah. And perhaps that's also a bit of posturing as well, mm. maybe to right. try to regain a sense of control. Because mm, mm-hmm. he doesn't have his subjects there either. No, no. At the moment, he doesn't really have anything to influence any form of control over. Not using the Force or no one under him. He's just essentially constantly bargaining with Thrawn. Mm. And that's probably very exhausting as well. Oh, so that's an interesting take on Sabaoth. But what's your take on Thrawn in this chapter? I think Thrawn's also a little destabilized because his plan didn't work. He doesn't seem like one who's used to his plans failing. Although he does seem to have yeah. a contingency for it. He didn't seem particularly bothered to have to get Team 4 in rather than Team 8. I, I think there's probably a bit of posturing with him going on as well because he had a plan that failed, so he wants to regain his image. At mm. the same time, it failed to a Jedi, and he doesn't right. seem to think much of the Force. No. And so he's, I think he's trying to act like, no, everything's fine. There's still not much of a threat, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. It's got Maya Salamiri. Everything's good. Yeah. <laughs> I do wonder, like, why not overwhelm them? Like, why why have Team Four and Team Eight? If it was, if it was like, if if there was just like, like, eighty of these little dudes with their little net launchers, <laughs> they could have easily taken them out. Well, they're right. probably on different missions throughout the galaxy, and he, I don't think he fully understands the threat that a Jedi poses. Um, mm-hmm. I think he well, willfully doesn't understand it. 
Well, not even just Jedi, though, because, I mean, you know, Leia's there as well, which is a high political figure right now. Mm. Also a Jedi. Yeah, also, yeah. No, I think if it hadn't been for Luke, they would have been captured for sure. True, yeah, true. Yeah. I think, as yeah, as Tim put it, Thrawn was overreaching by trying to manipulate things and getting Luke to also be captured at the same time, because he was a last-minute addition to that mission. Right, he was. Or maybe he wasn't even mm. aware of Luke. Maybe mm. not. Well, I mean, he knows Luke. I mean, aware of his existence, but not aware that he would be there because he was a last minute addition. He may not be aware of Luke's talents, though, as well, because you know, he knows that he knows to an extent what the Force can do because he saw Sabaoth use the lightning in the cave, but he doesn't know much about, you know, like the combat of a Jedi and, and using the Force in combat mm. to fight off. You know, he's just like, oh, the Force can shoot lightning, but he doesn't know what else the Force can do. He doesn't know that the Force can do a lot of make a, a, a fighter so much better. I think part of it may also be that he wants to prove he's better than Luke because Luke's that farm boy who blew up mm-hmm. the Death Star twice yeah. and defeated uh-huh. Palpatine and Vader. And like, so he's like, no, you didn't defeat us this entire time. I will mm. best you. You are nothing compared to me, you know? He must have had some idea of what a lightsaber could do against a blaster because he sent the Nogar after him with this, the Stogli sticks, not blasters. Right, yeah. Those are pretty effective against lightsabers and also effective for capturing. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So um, I was thinking of the moment when Pelion submits an idea uh, yeah. and Thrawn was like, yeah, it works. Mm. It's totally useful. Um, and then Pelion, to himself, wonders if Thrawn would have accepted an idea, a useful idea from mm. the Jedi mm. as well, meaning uh, mm. Sabaoth. He seems to have a lot of disdain for any Jedi in particular, <laughs> mm. especially Sabaoth. Moving over to the Republic section of this chapter, and we talked about posturing between both Thrawn and uh, Sabaoth. Phalia, Phalea yes. <laughs> is quite performative uh, character. Mm-hmm. He is very yeah. <laughs> specifically posturing for political gain. But also, I have to kind of wonder. Of course, we know from outside that this is a, an imperial scheme. But do you think that he is? rightly being skeptical or is he just being a contrarian in this council he seems like he's got a pretty big ego Mm. as well so i'd say probably contrarian i interpret it more as an experienced an experience okay yeah i think he genuinely means well Mm. um i don't think he has the same instincts as the rest Mm. but i i do think he you know his own personal ambitions aside i think he does also want to do good yeah because like if it was me in that position that you know some unknown assailants and unknown assailants you can't find record record of them and there was just some corruption going on here but that doesn't necessarily point to like a big plot of anything it could just be something that's contained to that planet or yeah you know some sort of and it doesn't really require a big military operation no no or it doesn't necessarily yeah so So while i do think like he's trying to uh make his political power not known but like try to find an area where he can be right then if he is right he gets the the clout for right yeah for having called it correctly and i mean that that interpretation of events from that perspective you know even looking outside of his ambitions i think is personally reasonable Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think this is something that would be a very fair thing to debate amongst this kind of council yeah Mm -hmm. to try to hash out the severity of what happened yeah and respond appropriately especially when you're trying to set up a government and are very spread thin Mm -hmm. i think um as han said in the end of the last chapter that they want a squad of X-Wings would probably be mm-hmm. a little bit too much. Like, if mm-hmm. I'm not sure yeah. how they break up their military, but, like, 
the, a protective detail wouldn't be bad, if, as he points out that yeah. they got there somehow, presuming they're not local to the planet. They had a ride out, and the, you got to look out for any ships that might pursue you in, in that way. Yes, yeah. You know, that's not the worst thing. Um, another thought I had is that I think Ophelia is also potentially trying to bring up what it would look like diplomatically mm. to come there with like this big show of power. Yeah. Because I think we also have to remember that they don't have any control over this planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're trying to make a good impression. Yeah. You know, not like an impression like, oh, we'll just blast you in submission. But even outside of that, you know, let, let's be real. These characters have to know that anyone aside from the core group who's going to co go along with mm. them is not going to make it out. <laughs> 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 hey guys we were, yeah. on this special mission we want you to wear this red uniform yeah <laughs> why, why, why the change of uniform <laughs> move along red shirt yeah it won't matter you won't be wearing it for yeah, right <laughs> sorry all the extra plot armors in the wash uh -huh. <laughs> on the way there you should tell me about your hopes and dreams about the future <laughs> <laughs> Oh, is there any tragedy in your backstory I should know about? <laughs> is there anybody that's like two weeks out from retirement? This would be the perfect mission for them. <laughs> <laughs> One nationalism before you go. Anyone new? And this is their first mission. <laughs> <laughs> Failure is really well described in this chapter, though. There's, there's some very good imagery yeah. about their posturing. And I feel like I get a really good sense of the air of this character, really. Yeah, there's this one thing where after he says something, it says that he said it with that air of wounded pride that he did so well. Yeah. And I really, really love that description. Mm, yeah, very nice. Um, another thing that I really liked seeing in this chapter was Han sticking up for the importance of Leia's Jedi training. Mm. Because when we're first introduced to him, he's straight up just like, Hey, the force doesn't exist. All I need is a blaster mm -hmm. and yeah. <laughs> you know, hokey religion. And now he is like, now he gets it. Yeah. Yeah. And he prioritizes it even. Yeah. Part of that probably because he's like, y you need another weapon, but I mean, Hey, <laughs> yeah. The other part is probably because he understands. Yeah. I think that shows the transformation from like a, a new hope where he's very selfish and further <laughs> beyond thinking more about other people and, and, what they can bring to the table or even just like their sensitivities as well. Yes. I think that's um, really good character development for, for Han. And it feels, I felt like Han was really well Han in this movie. Yeah, not movie. <laughs> in this chapter. <laughs> yes. It did feel all, all the kind of like the mannerisms as well of him jabbing a finger and like, <laughs> I, I felt like <laughs> they really captured it captured him well yeah I, I like that restraint he showed at the beginning too um i think he had an exchange with Phalia and he really really wanted to just like say something extremely sarcastic but he held himself back and mm. was like no i'll be more diplomatic <laughs> and then there's a little bit of ego <laughs> depletion towards the end of the chapter where he becomes a little bit more combative oh yeah right yeah i thought it was weird how like they seem to have no backup plan for Leia at all no. it's like in, because once she asked for some time for herself he's like maybe in a year and it's like she's pregnant with twins like she like that's definitely gonna come out within the next year what are you gonna do yeah yeah like she i'm sure she'll be able to do stuff after that after she gives birth but like you can't just expect her to just be there constantly mm. yeah they they really 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 need more officials to work alongside them yeah i'm also confused why ooh, do they just not have anyone they trust what why 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 the time span of a year that's a very good question i think it's just like conservative political estimates but yeah you should be able to train somebody maybe not for that high of a position but at least to delegate subtasks of a position yeah i'm sure if this had been written in this decade or the last there would be a lot more because there would be a lot more memes of background characters to take advantage of for care for new characters <laughs> right what's your like like assistant's name winter. winter 
Oh, winter. Right, yeah. That girl is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't miss her. Yeah, but she seems perfect to take care of the kids while, you know, lays off after, you know, after the fact, after back to work. I feel like she would be wasted as a nanny, though. She seems to have, so far, very good skills and, you know, political experience. So I'm not sure how that's going to, how she would be relegated to just being the nanny. Yeah, but she seems like the kind of nanny that could, like, you know, teach the kids and introduce them to that kind of thing, though. Nah, just throw them on the falcon. They'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of like mom away from mom, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I forget. In this chapter, did they mention that it's a boy and a girl? They, 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 do they know that? I feel like I remember that being mentioned in this chapter. That has been mentioned. Because in the last one, he said, I'm protecting you, your sister, your niece, and your nephew. Uh, so yeah. it is known that there's boy, boy and girl. Yeah, well, I mean, okay. Luke might have been able to figure it out through the Force or something. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure they have medical technology to uh, sort those things out as well. <laughs> well, I guess, yeah. I mean, I guess it also depends on how far along she is, but I guess they could also figure that out pretty early, depending on, you know, the technology. I do keep forgetting that they are not, like, hiding underground anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean they're not hiding underground? Well, because when you're the rebellion, you have to be a little more yeah. subtle about what you do and where you go. But I feel like they definitely have more freedom to move about. And they like, yeah, if I'm sure she has some sort of medical treatment from someone that there or something. I mean, they're on the galactic capital of Coruscant. So right. they might have some like genetic testing or, you know, we don't know what space medicine's like. So Probably better than ours. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> Everybody's is better than ours. <laughs> Where is Luke while these things are going on? Because everybody acknowledges that Jedi are important for some reason. But he's not present in any of the meetings. Is he trying to? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. What, what, what is the purpose of the Jedi? Yeah. If this is a debriefing on, like, you guys were almost captured, et cetera, et cetera, you know, shouldn't Luke have been there? Because he seems like he would have been pretty much a, a key witness to every well he was yeah and could have given them a lot of insight into this whole capture attempt i wonder if there's some parallels to thrawn to be found there but just not a disdain for the jedi but just a lack of understanding for their importance because they don't seem mm. to value leia's jedi training as much as the immediate needs either yeah. so i think it's a softer form yeah of what we see with thrawn and I'm wondering if that's going to be a major theme throughout this book. I think you might be right about that too, yeah. Because, uh, like, even the political role of the Jedi is unclear in the in the prequels and mm. the Old Republic as well. It seems, you know, there's yeah. church and state kind of things going on, but this church also has, like, demonstrable telekinetic power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this church has proof. <laughs> it's kind of kind of odd that that part isn't explored as much as as it is like we kind of like we we get it they're the guardians of peace and and uh protects the galaxy but they're also not space cops i mean they were in the prequels i mean they qui-gon obi-wan right. literally went to enforce a trade deal <laughs> at the same time though prequels did not exist at this time right yeah when this was written what did what did Obi Wan say in the in the New Hope? For a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace throughout the galaxy. Before the before the dark times, before the Empire. I mean, that doesn't tell you much, but like it sounds pretty damn cool. It it does. <laughs> it really does. It it gives me more of a samurai vibe than a space cop vibe. I guess that's uh, the parallel that we have to draw then. Is that these are the, the people who are keepers of the peace and philosophical and artistic nobility almost. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. I don't know. It's hard to just imagine this stuff on the fly. Like there's definitely like some sort of like fuzzy image that they that they have, but like really hammering it down is a little difficult. Well, I'm calling it now that we're building up to a major, major affirmation of the importance of the Force at some point later in this story. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely going to be 
some sort of clash of ideologies. But I mean, it is bizarre that Luke is not there. You're right. Is there any other comments about this chapter before we close? Not really. I did like how it was dual sided. Mm. Yeah. It was pretty cool. I like seeing the similarities between each side. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if Phalia parallels Sabaoth in a way. Mm. We can you think, I, huh. <laughs> Who do you think parallels Thrawn then? Oh, man. That's Mon a question. Mothma. I would say maybe Probably. Mon Mothma, yeah. 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 Or maybe Phalia and Pelion are parallels. Mm. Actually, no. I feel like Akbar would be more of, of a Pelion parallel. Yeah. I mean, it's also asymmetric as well. You've got six characters on one side and three characters on the other. Yes, but our heroes are special. <laughs> <It's a> special. <laughs> but I'm sure we'll uh, get more juxtaposition in the chapters to come. Yes, I'm excited. <laughs> this has been The Lost Holocron. You can find transcripts, links to discussions, and more on our website, lostholocron.com. While you're there, you can learn how to support the creation of future episodes. Read on, and we'll be waiting for you in the next transmission. We would be honored if you would join us.